Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now we've had the release of the Galaxy S21. In some areas you've got the Snapdragon 888, in other areas you've got the Exynos 2100. I've done videos here on this channel and over on the Speedtest G channel showing the difference in performance and the battery life and the efficiency between the Snapdragon processor and the Exynos processor. And while the Exynos CPU is excellent this year and certainly up there maybe even better than the Snapdragon processor, the GPU, we still have the Mali GPU and it's not quite as good as the Adreno GPU from Qualcomm. Now, if you remember back in 2019, Samsung signed a deal with AMD to provide a GPU for its processors for smartphones and maybe for other devices, I'm thinking you know, Chromebooks or something like that. And that was like one and a half years ago, in a few months time, it will be two years time since that's happened. And a lot of people in the comments underneath my videos were saying, the AMD uh, GPU will save the Exynos process, the AMD GPU will solve all of Samsung's problems. So today I wanna to look at that question, is that true? Will the AMD uh, GPU solve all of Samsung's problems? Well, if you wanna find out, Please, well, let me explain. So as I said, back in 20, summer of 2019, Samsung signed this deal with AMD so that it would replace the Mali GPU with the AMD GPU. Now, just a couple of things before we dive into this. One is, before anybody writes it down in the comments, yes, Adreno is an anagram of Radeon, Radeon, because 10 years ago, Qualcomm did buy the mobile GPU department section of ATI graphics as it was then, but that was 10 years ago. And while the name was there kind of as a throwback to remember its roots, 10 years in technology is a long, long time. And please stop writing in the comments, but Qualcomm are using AMD's GPU anyway, because they're not, okay? They bought the company, all the staff, everything moved over, and they've been doing their own work, their own development on that for the last decade. So let's not continue with that nonsense, please. So, of course, AMD are very well known for its processors and for its GPUs. And, of course, it's got GPUs in the desktop. Now, of course, the challenge, what we're looking at is can you take a desktop GPU and bring it right down to a mobile? So to do that, we're going to be looking at AMD's uh, GPUs, this RDNA architecture. We're going to be looking at the challenges of bringing something down from the desktop to the, uh, to the smartphone and uh, see whether this really is a great a deal as some people are hoping. Okay, let's just uh, dive in. So a quick refresher of the timeline. RDNA, this new uh, Radeon DNA, Radeon DNA was announced in 2019. Uh, in May 2019, in June 2019, AMD and Samsung announced their strategic partnership for ultra low power, high performance technologies. Uh, and uh, AMD will license custom graphics IP based on the recently announced uh, RDNA to Samsung for using its mobile devices, including smartphones and other products that complement, not compete with, complement AMD's uh, product offerings. In July 2019, we had the AMD uh, Radeon Radeon RX 5700 series, that's with the RDNA 1 uh, architecture in it. Then in March 2020, we got RDNA 2 was announced. October 2020, we actually got the first RDNA 2 graphics card. And then in January 2021, Samsung confirms that the AMD GPU will be in the next flagship smartphone processor. Not necessarily in the next flagship smartphone, but the next flagship smartphone processor. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So RDNA 1, as we're now going to call it, graphics processors built on the RDNA architecture will span from power efficient notebooks and smartphones to the world's largest supercomputers and everything in between, including uh, you know laptops and desktops and so on. To accommodate so many scenarios, the overall system architecture is designed for scalability while boosting performance over previous generations. So this was a new microarchitecture that AMD were working on and has worked on and, and released graphics cards with. Now, the big thing about the difference in the architecture before the previous architecture, which was the GCN architecture, is this Wave32 idea. We'll just go into it very quickly. A kernel is a single stream of instructions that operate on a large number of data parallel work items. And of course, remember with a GPU, the point is that you're working on lots and lots of things at the same time. So you apply the same maths to many, many pixels, vertices, whatever, in parallel. And that's how GPUs work. That's different to how CPUs work in general. GPUs do lots of things on parallel things. 
And in the previous architecture, that sort of uh, group of instructions that we were working on was called a wavefront and it was with 64 items. And when every work item in a wavefront was executing exactly the same instruction, that was mega efficient because you've got these 64 things happening in parallel, do it once, do it twice, do it 64 times, brilliant. However, the RDNA architecture is natively designed with a narrower wavefront now of 32 items called wave 32. Now, why do that? Well, three reasons. First of all, that today's modern shaders and code that you write for GPUs is not just a simple set of instructions. You get loops and you get branches. And this means that when you get a, 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 a block of 64 instructions that have to branch off and do something, then the overall efficiency suffers since each instruction will execute only a partial wavefront. And some of that wavefront is disabled, is not used because you branch somewhere else. A narrower 32 wave uh, approach improves that efficiency for when you've got things like loops and branches going on. Secondly, the narrow wave front completes faster and therefore uses fewer resources for accessing data, that's memory. So the wave 32 model, for example, has half the number of registers. And since the wave front will complete quicker, because only doing 32 rather than 64, then those registers free up quicker, enabling the next and more active wave fronts. Thirdly, splitting the workload into smaller 32 data flows increases the number of wave fronts, which means that you get greater parallelism. Now, here's the key, and we're going to talk a lot about this. The the design block, the fundamental DNA, if we want to use that word, of the uh, uh, Radeon uh, DNA, uh, RDNA architecture is the dual compute unit. The dual compute unit. And you'll see that when uh, AMD talk about their graphics cards, they talk about how many compute units it have. And they come in pairs. Okay, now the dual compute unit uh, is the essence of the RDNA architecture and replaces the compute unit from the previous uh, generation. Now inside of it, you have four SIMDs, that's single instruction, multiple data units that operate independently. And each SIMD includes 32 ALUs. Now the ALU is the arithmetic logic unit. That's basically the thing that does the maths, the thing that does the actual calculation. Now that's twice as wide as what you had uh, in the previous generation. So four SMINDs that work independently, and each one of those has 32 ALUs, and that is the structure of a compute unit, and they come in pairs, and they share some of the stuff between them so that, uh, that they can work together in, uh, as, a, as a unit, but as a pair. So let's have a look at the uh, Radeon RX 5700 XT. And that comes with 40 compute units, and we can see here it's divided into shader engines, and depending on how you look at this diagram, I think there are four shader engines here, and each of those has five dual compute units. So that means there are 10 compute units in each shader engine, and then there are 40 in total, and they all share some common things. So for example, if we look at that, we can see there's a rasterization that happens in each shader engine. Okay, but then there are things like the geometry processor and the graphics command processor that are common amongst the four shader engines here. So in all these things, you start with the compute unit that is the minimum kind of low level uh, architecture, the kind of the DNA here. And then that expands up to the dual compute engine, that expands up to a shader engine. And then there is even greater than that. You see that in the whole processor, there are things that are shared amongst different things, like I said, the geometry processing and so on. So there's never anything that's independent. Everything is, of course, interlinked. And it just depends on how you drill down. But where you get the multiplication bit to the 40 CUs, you take those dual compute engines and you keep replicating them. And here we can see they're replicating them in bunches of five, meaning there's 10 uh, CUs, and then there are four lots of those. And you can keep building that out as you get to bigger and bigger and bigger graphics cards. Or, and this is what we're gonna talk about, you can shrink that down. And that's what we're gonna have to talk about in a minute when we talk about smartphones. But of course, that does lead us to the interesting question, what is a core? Because we often talk about GPU cores. It's got 300 cores, it's got 12 cores, it's got thousands of cores, because it depends on what do you mean by a core? Is it the ALU, the thing that does the actual maths? And some people would say, yes, that's the core because it's the bit that's doing the adding up. And there are lots and lots and lots of them. The more you have of those, the better and faster your graphics card is. Or is it the compute unit or the dual compute unit? That is also a question. Or is it the shader engine as, as you get it as a whole? Because you can't function, for example, without the geometry processor. So, you know, are there, because these things are required, is that the minimum uh, kind of way you look at it? So, when you talk about cores, when we talk about smartphones, when we talk about desktops, when we talk about compute units, it's very important to understand that terminology between 
Nvidia, AMD, ARM with their Mali, Imagination Technology, Apple, they all use different terminologies for what they really mean as a core or as a compute unit or as a whatever the term they're using so that we can kind of not try to make parallels between two different sets of terminologies and say, oh, look, that's got 12, that's got 3,000. Oh, this must be better. We've got to really understand what's uh, what's going on here. Now, RDNA 2, of course, is a tweaked version, an improved version of the fundamental same RDNA uh, architecture. But they are saying there is a 50% increase in performance per watt. Now, of course, that's very important when it comes to dealing with smartphones because RDNA 2 is more power efficient than RDNA 1. And it's also got some extra features. It's got ray tracing and it's got variable rate shading. Now, of course, variable rate shading is something we saw in the latest Snapdragon processor. And the other thing about RDNA 2 is that uh, AMD have now a solid track record of providing its customers with a custom version of its RDNA architecture inside of a chip. So both the Xbox uh, X and the PlayStation 5 used RDNA 2 type GPUs. There's some discussion about whether it's really RDNA 1, RDNA 2, RDNA 1.5, how much of it custom, how much of it that's for all the Xbox and, and, and PlayStation people to talk about. But the point is AMD now have an established record of taking some custom work and doing it for another customer, Sony or Microsoft, so they can do it in their thing. And now they're doing a similar thing, but not quite the same with Samsung and seeing what they can provide for Samsung, but not now in the game console, but down at the smartphone to a much lower uh, target. And if you look at some of the chips that have been produced, you've got the RX 6800 with 72 compute units. You've got the RX 6800 without the XT part, 60 compute units, the 6900 XT with 80 compute units. But here's the important thing. They've quoted some power numbers. So the 6800 XT at two gigahertz plus, there's some boost clocks in there and so on, it's 300 watts. And the, the 60 compute unit one is 250 watts. And then they've managed to keep it at 300 watts for the 80 compute unit version of the 6900 XT. Now, these numbers are important because we're dealing with 300 watts. And you've seen what these graphics cards look like. They've got big fans on them. You know, they're quite large, you know, bigger than a smartphone. In fact, the whole thing is bigger than what you get in a smartphone. Now, a smartphone doesn't deal with 300 watts or 200 watts or 50 watts. We're dealing with a few watts, three watts, four watts five watts, depending on how you're allocating the budget between the CPU and the GPU. Now, that's obviously a magnitude different to what you get in a desktop PC. So the challenge for AMD is enormous to take that same architecture and take it from 300 watts down to three watts. Okay, now that's a huge change. So how are they gonna do that? Now, I just did a quick calculation here and you can see that if you take 300 uh, compute cores, uh, sorry, 300 watts and 80 compute units, that's 3.7 watts per compute unit. So that's huge. Uh, that's, and if you have two of those, because they come in dual, that's you know over six watts, almost seven watts. So that's nowhere gonna be good enough for a, a smartphone. So something's gonna have to be different. So first of all, are they gonna use RDNA 1 or RDNA 2? My guess is it's gonna be based on RDNA 2 because it is more power efficient and uh, AMD have been underlining the power efficiency of RDNA 2. And also it fits in with the timelines from when RDNA was announced, when Qualcomm, when Samsung, sorry, took the agreement with AMD and so on and so on. So it looks like it's gonna be RDNA 2 because of power efficiency, because it does fit in well with the timelines. And then the first question is, how many compute units is it going to be? How many compute engines is it going to be? And of course, really, it's going to be a minimum of two because they come in this dual compute engine design, which, as we read earlier, is the essence of the RDNA architecture. So if you have two of those, and we saw that's quite a high a wattage number, there's some other things that are going to have to change. Now, one of the big things, of course, change is the clock frequency. We're talking about 1.8 gigahertz, 2 gigahertz, boosting up to higher numbers. So obviously, when you go down to a smartphone, we're talking much, much lower. We're talking probably 500 megahertz, 400 megahertz. I don't know. We'll see what the final numbers are, but it's not going to be 2 gigahertz GPU uh, in no way whatsoever. And lowering that frequency, maybe they can also lower the voltage. And the voltage is the key thing because part of the power equation means whatever the voltage level is, when you square that, that actually has an impact on the power. So small change in the voltage can actually have a big impact on battery life. So we need to bring down the voltage, bring down the clock speed, reduce the number of compute units down to the bare minimum, and then apply some kind of smartphone only optimizations 
to the RDNA2 architecture, and then that's the kind of direction that AMD will be going in to build this GPU. And then, of course, on top of that, we've got to ask ourselves the questions, where, what about the features? Will there be the ray tracing in it? Will there be the variable rate shading? My guess would be you'll get variable rate shading, you won't get ray tracing. Just a guess, because ray tracing is still new in the desktop area. It'd be nice to have it in mobile, but for their first generation they're giving to Samsung, I think let's just leave that out and let's just go with a, you know something that works with Vulkan and OpenGL and all that kind of stuff. Don't worry about shade, uh, ray tracing at the moment, but variable rate shading is good for battery life. And of course, that is important because you can shade less pixels. You can kind of take the neighbor and say, oh, I'll be the same color as him. Uh, and that way you've got, you don't have a problem. You can reduce the amount of power you need. And that's great for smartphones. And so the final question is, will we see this in the Note 21 at some point later in this year, or will we first see it in the S22 in 2022, according to Ice Universe, the uh, the uh, uh, well-known leaker on the on Twitter, we will see Samsung release uh, Samsung with AMD GPUs in the second or the third quarter of 2021, which will be used in the next Exynos 2000 and 1000 series. Of course, Samsung may change the release time of these processors. So he's basically saying that. It is a possibility we're going to see it in the Note 21. That's what he's saying. Samsung haven't denied or confirmed that. It would be interesting for them actually to come up with the Note 21, make it actually differentially different than the S21. The pen, the S Pen was obviously one of the big differences. That maybe it's kind of worn a bit thin. Maybe that's not really that such a big difference nowadays. If it had a whole new uh, processor in it, that would be great. And then the S22, could kind of pick it up from there. And then maybe we'll see this new thing that in fact, it's the Note series that launches the processor and the S range follows on the year round rather than the other way around. At the moment, it's the S range that launches the new processor and then the uh, Note range follows on. So maybe that will switch around. We'll have to wait and see. So whatever happens, exciting times ahead. But the key question, although this all looks very, very exciting, although this all looks potential, the thing we have to remember, this is the first time AMD are uh, not ATI that sold their mobile unit to Qualcomm 10 years ago, but the first time the current AMD is building a smartphone GPU or the technology for the smartphone GPU and then putting that in Samsung, Samsung's chip. And that's hard. Going from 300 watts to three watts and giving good performance is hard. I don't say it's not possible. I'm not saying that AMD can't do it. I think maybe they can, but let's not jump to conclusions until we actually see it in a smartphone running some actual games and some benchmarks and some workloads with a battery, with the heat that it's going to produce and see what happens. I really hope that AMD can do it because it really could shake up the whole mobile uh, industry. But let's not assume that it's a dead cert because you've got Qualcomm, you've got Mali from ARM, you've got Imagination Tech GPU, the power VR that you see in the iPhone. Now you've got the AMD. None of these people make GPUs. It's a guarantee that their GPU is going to be the best. You've got this competition and you, it's hard to suggest that the, the, the outsider who's never made that mobile GPU goes to first place in their first year. It can happen, but that's a, that's a real sort of long shot Hollywood movie kind of thing. Maybe it will be. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, that's it. My name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this look at how AMD's new GPU, based on RDNA 2 probably, could save the Exynos process. If you did, please, please do give it a thumbs up. And I tell you, we're all at the mercy of the YouTube uh, recommendation algorithm. So rather than seeing whether my videos are going to come up in your feed, the best thing to do is to subscribe to the video, uh, channel and click that bell notification icon. Then you'll know when I've released a new video. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.